Hello, everybody. I think uh, many of us are now in the room. Some more uh, friends and colleagues joining the uh, webinar. Maybe we'll give another couple of minutes for people to to uh, jump on board. All right, um, I guess we are all ready to start today's webinar. Uh, I'd like to uh, say good morning to our friends uh, who are joining us from Europe. Uh, good evening for friends who are joining us from different parts of Asia. My name is Ding Li and uh, I am from the Oriental Bird Club. Uh, on behalf of the Oriental Bird Club, we are very pleased to have you join us tonight uh, or this morning. On this webinar on one of Asia's most mysterious shorebirds, the Nordmans or Spotted Greenshank. Uh, we have a very exciting program for you uh, with two really passionate speakers who will bring together some of the most updated and interesting work that is done on this threatened shorebird from both the breeding grounds of the Nordmans Greenshank as well as the wintering grounds of the Nordmans Greenshank. Um, and we will introduce a bit more about their work shortly. Uh, perhaps as a little bit of housekeeping, um, I would like to start off by um, saying that the chat box is open for us to post comments and questions. Uh, we are very, very keen to hear your comments, your thoughts and questions about uh, the work that our friends uh, Kim Im and Philip will present in their talks later on. So feel free to put your comments and thoughts in the chat box. And um, feel free to say hi to fr uh, from wherever in the world you are joining us from. All right, um, and um, together with me on today's webinar, I have uh, three or four more of my colleagues from the uh, Oriental Bird Club. I have got with me here, Paul in Sokao. Um Paul will come in in a bit to talk a little bit about the work that we do at the OBC on the conservation of threatened species in Asia. I've also got with uh, us here, Chris Goody, our chairman. Uh, who is on the call on video, uh, as well as uh, Vivian Fu, uh, who is our media master. She will be working with me and Paul to uh, moderate tonight's uh, or this morning's webinar on the Green Shang. Um, I can see many friends already on the call, so I guess we shouldn't wait any longer because there's a lot of interesting stories and experiences to be heard from our speakers. I would like to first pass the floor to Paul to take uh, us through the work of the club. Uh, Paul, who many of us know in the conservation world, Paul also works very closely with some of us on this call on conservation projects in Asia and Africa. So uh, he knows everything that we should know about conservation in the region. Uh, he's got a long history of working in Southeast Asia. So Paul, the floor is yours to take us through the wonderful work that the club is doing. Over to you, Paul. Thank you, Ding Lee. That's very kind of you. I'm sure I don't know everything I need to know about conservation in Southeast Asia. Uh, but yeah, I have I have spent about 20 years working in conservation there. Um, so yeah, my name is Paul Inswakow and I chair the Conservation Committee of the Oriental Bird Club. I'm just going to take a few of your minutes to uh, explain uh, what the Oriental Bird Club is and what we do. Um, and hopefully get you a bit more involved in it. Um, so I'm guessing and uh, expect quite a few of you are members already. Um, so the Oriental Bird Club is a, a global club. We have members all over the world, uh, particularly a lot in Europe and a lot in Asia, as you would expect. 
but for people who have a really keen interest in Asian birds and their conservation. So club members get this, if you can see that, uh, birding Asia a couple of times a year, um, and the Journal of Asian Ornithology. I'm trying to get that you can see on the screen. Um, there are digital digital versions of that as well for a slightly cheaper um, membership fee. Um, but importantly, from what I do in the Oriental Bird Club, is we, we fund um, small conservation projects throughout Asia, from, from Pakistan in the West, all the way through to Indonesia and the Philippines in the East. And we, we fund about 20 different projects a year. Um, a lot of them are focused on globally threatened birds. Uh, but we encourage projects that have a conservation focus, whether they be surveys for birds that are poorly known, uh, research, or just on the ground action um, for conservation of, of birds at a particular site. Uh, we particularly like to, to fund people uh, who are from the region. Um, one of our grantees is on the uh, cool today, uh, Kim Im from Bird Conservation Society of Thailand, which has received a grant from the OBC, just to give you a, a flavour of the kind of um, projects that we do fund. Um, in particular, one of our areas of interest is shorebirds, migratory shorebirds. Um, and we have a, a special fund dedicated to migratory shorebirds. So we, as well as encouraging you to become a member, we can we encourage you to also donate to the Oriental Bird Club. We are a 100% volunteer run organization. So all donations, 100% goes to um, conservation projects. And if you've got a particularly strong interest in shorebirds, uh, when you donate through the OBC con uh, website, you can specify shorebirds and it will go into that fund. Um, so yeah, without further ado, I don't want to take up too much of your time. You've got a couple of really interesting uh, presentations coming up. So I'll hand back to Ding Lee and uh, enjoy the rest of the webinar. Thank you very much, Paul, for that uh, introduction to the work of the club. Um, and as we, uh, many of us here will know, the club uh, um, has a a, a very large reach to its conservation projects in many different parts of Asia. Uh, many of us uh, have heard about the different kinds of work that the club does in different uh, corners of Southeast Asia. So uh, do support the wonderful work that the club and its grantees are doing to conserve some of the region's most threatened species. Uh, coming back to the webinar, uh, the Notman's Green Shang. Today's uh, webinar is titled Knowing the Notman's Green Shang. And I know that uh, many of us here on this call are shorebird experts. Uh, many of you, uh, I can see your names. You've done a lot of great work on shorebirds and monitoring across the region. But many more of you are also fairly new to the species. And we hope that today's webinar will bring you uh, through the life history um, and also the conservation of this really animatic shorebird. This shorebird, as many of us know, uh, as bird watchers, is not a particularly common species. It's probably the second rarest shorebird that we have here in Asia. And uh, some of the work that's been done in the last few years to try to quantify its population uh, is telling us that the, the global population of the Notman Green Shang is unlikely to exceed 1,200 individuals. So a really, really rare shorebird. Um, and not much really is known about where it breeds its nesting ecology and all that. So uh, to answer these questions, I think the first part of our presentation, which will start and move on the north to south axis, uh, will be uh, by our uh, colleague and friend, uh, Philip Maleko. Philip works for the Wildlife Conservation Society. Uh, he's a very, very active shorebird researcher and conservationist, and he's done some really cool and exciting work in the uh, large forests of the Russian Far East. This is where the Notman's Greenshank breed, and many of us probably have learned in recent months or recent years that through Philip's research, he's found a few more nests of these uh, waders in the trees of, uh, or in, the, in the large trees in the Russian Far East. So really interesting shorebird with a very unusual ecology. I guess without any further ado, I will pass the floor to Philip to take us through its ecology and its uh, mystery in the Russian Far East. Uh, Philip, over to you. Bingley, thank you very much for that wonderful introduction. 
Um, let me share my screen here and get everything going. So, uh, very wonderful to be here. Thank you so much for everybody joining us today. It is a pleasure to be talking to you. So, getting to know the Nordman's green shank, not only breeding, but also migration ecology. Um, so, as many of us know, um, shorebirds throughout the East Asian Australasian flyway have been declining for decades now, with about 12 species of shorebirds under threat of extinction just in this one small flyway, and populations really declining precipitously, anywhere from 5 to 9 percent each year, depending on the species and the region. And there has been just a plethora of work done throughout the flyway on the reasons of this decline, what can be done, uh, to halt it or, or prevent it with mixed results for better or worse. But instead of um, focusing on the negative, we'll be today focusing on a little bit of positive, um, a shorebird that is near and dear to many of us, the Nordman's Greenshank, an endemic to the East Asian Australasian flyway and a rare and endangered species, as Dingley said, with a minimum population of around 1,200 individuals. Uh, but one of the most important elements of Nordman's green shank is that it is an umbrella species, uh, which means that it can be a excellent tool for conservation of other shorebirds throughout the flyway, specifically, specifically because Nordman's green shanks rely on various habitat types throughout their annual cycle, and thus by protecting them, we're protecting many other shorebirds that rely on those habitats. So at first, I'm going to give you a little uh, back around about the, um, the Nordman's green shanks annual cycle. And we'll begin uh, with breeding in the Russian Far East. So the Russian Far East is the breeding area for most East Asian Australasian flyaway shorebirds. And for Nordman's green shanks specifically, there are only two confirmed breeding sites at the moment. The first is Chivo Bay here on Sakhalin Island, where in 1973, Vitaly Andreevich Nechayev found uh, several nests. And no nests have been found for a really long time until we took up uh, a study on Nordman's Green Breeding Ecology in Shastia Bay, where we found several nests. But then there are also these two other regions, uh, Magadan Oblast in the north here, and then the Greater Academy Bay region uh, to the west that may also have populations of breeding green shanks. So from the breeding grounds, the species travels to the Yellow Sea region um, during spring and uh, fall migration, and it stops here for several weeks to months at a time. And in the region, we know that Tiaozini specifically is a very important area. But we're also curious what other uh, sites in this region are important for green shanks. So then from there, uh, and green shanks travel to the broader Southeast Asian region. And we know the uh, stronghold for the species during a winter period is specifically in our Gulf of Thailand, the Thai Malay Peninsula, Indonesia, Myanmar, and uh, Bangladesh. But we're also curious about this greater Eastern Southeast Asian region as well. Uh, maybe there are sites there that have not been surveyed or, you know, it's very difficult to survey. So there are possibly unident unidentified occupied sites that are in need of assessment. And then there are a plethora of sites uh, in between these breeding, uh, staging stopover, and uh, overwintering areas. And depending on the strategy that green shanks use during migration, you know they may require different sites uh, between each of these regions. So they're really the question is, what other sites require conservation attention? So that was really the objective of my study is to inform Nordman's green shank conservation needs by not only studying their breeding ecology, but also their migration ecology and site occupancy throughout the flyway. So uh, the first part of the presentation is focusing on their breeding ecology, uh, specifically in the Russian Far East, as I said before, the breeding area for most East Asian Australasian flyway shorebirds. And thus it is necessary to protect key areas throughout the Russian Far East to uh, bolster or restore shorebird populations. So my study occurred in a small lagoon uh, called Shastia Bay in Khabarovsk Krai in the Russian Far East. And this bay is unique 
and suitable for Nordman green shanks because it has the four habitat types they need for successful reproduction. That is large forests and inland bogs where they nest uh, and meadows and intertidal mudflats where they forage and rear their young. And this study occurred between 2019 and 2021. So the first thing we learned about Nordman's green shank breeding is their phenology. Uh, green shanks arrive to the breeding grounds around the middle of May, and they begin nesting uh, just at the start of June, you know, after building their nests and, and starting to lay eggs. Finally, after an incubation period of around 25 days, the chicks start to hatch around the 24th of June was the earliest date, but we've also found uh, that chicks hatch into the first days of July. So then brood rearing happens directly after this and can last pretty much until August, uh, whereas southward migration from the breeding grounds for the non-breeding individuals or maybe the, the juveniles that have, or the, the first year adults uh, that maybe did not breed that year starts in the beginning of July, but really can last until uh, mid to late August as well. The second part of our um, research here in Russia was specifically focused on their nesting ecology. So we found nine total nests in the study period, uh, six active nests here uh, cartographed for you. We also found three inactive nests that I won't really be talking about today. And if you'd like to learn more about all of these nests, please visit our just published paper in Bird Conservation International. Very proud of this. Um, it's great to get some green shank uh, information out there in the broader sphere. So please give it a look, cite it in all of your future papers. So the first nest that we found in 2019 uh, was similar to a nest found by Vitaly Andreevich Nichayev in that it was on a large branch on the edge of a large forest fragment and inland bog about two kilometers from the intertidal zone. So one fascinating thing about Nordman's green shanks is that they are the only shorebird known in the world to build their own arboreal nests. Um, unlike other shorebirds, such as solitary pipers, sandpipers, or green sandpipers that also can nest arboreally, they occupy um, nests that other birds, such as thrushes or, um, or, or other various finches, have built, but green shanks, they put in the time and the work themselves and they build their own nests and they're very beautiful, covered in moss and lichens and branches and it's absolutely gorgeous. But in 2020, we made a, an ornithological discovery and for the first time found that Nordman's green shanks can also nest on the ground. So this was a nest situated uh, under a large branch with a full clutch on a hummocky inland bog uh, with many small dispersed larches throughout about a kilometer and a half from the intertidal zone. In 2021, the first three nests that we found were very similar to that last one in that they were all on the ground underneath these sapling larches um, with many other uh, sapling larches dispersed as well. But the fourth nest that we found was unlike the other previous five, uh, in that it was at the base of a mature uh, large, so a um, or rather rotund large large tree about two kilometers from the intertidal zone, and also this nest had a full clutch. So very curious, you know, some insights. Uh, not only were these nests the first that were, have been found since the 1970s, they're also the first uh, found on mainland Russia. Uh, we also discovered that the species displays a certain degree of nesting plasticity, i.e. it nests not only in trees, but also on the ground, and not only on the ground under a sapling larch, but also under mature larches. But this does present certain uh, questions and complications. For example, why uh, is this plasticity um, present? Why do green shanks choose to nest on the ground? versus on a tree? Is it because of concealment or maybe snow cover at the time of nest initiation? 
and our green shanks larch obligates. All of these nests were found associated with larch trees. And is that going to present uh, conservation issues for the future? Uh, large trees are very cold climate adapted and you know with possible climate change is issues there can be unstable precipitation patterns or wildfire regimes so maybe large trees are not really uh, built for the future well many questions uh, arise another one that i just thought of is about nest success are green shanks and nest on the ground more successful than green shanks and nest in trees or vice versa is there any sort of relationship there many questions left to be answered including uh, about nesting habitat availability and its relationship to uh, the green shank population. For example, in this photo shown here of a 50 by 100 meter grid with the green shank nest in the middle, you can tell that uh, there are many possibly suitable large trees all around the nesting tree. So what is, is, what is really limiting more green shanks nesting throughout the large forests of coastal Russian Far East? Or is our problems to the green shank population more rooted in other parts of the flyway? So that brings us to other parts of the flyway. Uh, the, Nord um, the Russian Far East is a critically important area and we can protect many sites throughout the region. But if we don't identify and protect sites throughout other parts of the East Asian Australasian flyway, protecting sites in Russia won't really um, do all that much good. So to identify sites, we need to track the species uh, throughout its annual cycle. So we captured and tagged birds at three sites. Uh, the first was in Thailand, in the in, Inner Gulf, in April 2016 and 2018 by Chen Zingyu, George Gale, and Andy Pierce. This is where they tagged two birds nicknamed D79 and Frankie. Then in April of 2022, uh, WWF Hong Kong and friends uh, tagged Su Ching at the Maipo Nature Reserve. And then myself and colleagues tagged 10 birds uh, in Shasti Bay in June and July of 2021. So the Thai and Hong Kong birds were tagged with four and a half gram solar platform transmitting terminals, uh, which relay data remotely via satellites. Uh, these tags are produ produced by microwave telemetry. Whereas in Russia, we tag birds with three and a half gram GPS transmitters developed by Druid Technology Incorporated and they required a receiver and or a Bluetooth signal to actually download that data. So all of these birds were tagged with the leg loop method. So some exciting results. Um, but I do want to say beforehand that, you know, the migratory pathways of uh, shorebirds are cyclic in nature. So I really could have started uh, anywhere from the overwintering or stopover or breeding grounds. Uh, but stick to the theme of the breeding area. We'll start from there. Uh, um, so birds started to, after, excuse me, <clears throat> after they nested, they started to, God, I'm so sorry. <clears throat> after they finished nesting, uh, they started to migrate out of the region in early July to late July. One of our birds, uh, D79, from Konstantin actually stopped in Shasti Bay on its way south. But after that, birds took a, um, a coastal route along the edge of the Russian Far East down uh, to the Korean Peninsula, where they started kind of diverging patterns. So most of our birds actually flew across the Korean Peninsula and then across the Yellow Sea, um, several stopping at several sites along the way until they reached that all important Tiao Zini Yangcheng wetland area. Whereas another bird, Su Ching, took a rather different route. And although it also flew across or, or along the coast of the Russian Far East, it actually went around uh, the Korean Peninsula, stopping at several sites along the way, then also crossing the Yellow Sea and arriving to that same exact uh, Tiao Zini Yangcheng wetland area.
So interestingly enough, all of these birds pretty much stayed uh, the fall in that Jiangsu coast. And just to highlight uh, that many more than just the Yangcheng Tao Zini uh, sites are important. We, for instance, have the Gyeonggi Bay on the border of North and South Korea. Union Gong, as we know, is, is uh, very important for other species, such as Asian Dowagers, and many other sites throughout this region. So from uh, the species stopover area, we have uh, not very many um, tracks especially for D79 and Suqing, there are really only one or two points from that area to Southeast Asia. So it's difficult to tell how or what migratory pathway they took. But once they reached Southeast Asia, they really, that's where the tracks really got interesting. So for example, uh, L1 flew across inland Vietnam and so did uh, Suqing. And L1 then flew across the, the Gulf, across uh, the Thai Malay Peninsula, and finally arriving to um, Medan in Indonesia on November 24th, whereas Su Ching, uh, after flying in, in, into inland Vietnam, flew west to Myanmar, where it stayed for almost a month from December 4th to December 27th, where then it jumped over to West Bengal, where it arrived on December 28th and has been ever has been there ever since. Uh, and this individual in West Bengal, from my knowledge, is the third ever recorded in the region. Um, but it's it's such a wide delta and maybe a very difficult to survey delta. So maybe there are, there are many more green shanks there than than we would have known. And we have many people out there searching diligently for this bird and other green shanks. And it's just so hard to survey out there that uh, makes makes your eye water. <laughs> those poor people. But wanted to highlight um, this movement in Vietnam. So Su Ching's points were concentrated from November twenty fifth to December third on the seemingly dry pond. And this area is about one hundred and fifty kilometers from the coast, so possibly the most inland site ever used by green shanks for an extended period of time. So it'd be really great to have some boots on the ground, uh, seeing what that site is like as well. But moving on, after uh, green shanks spent the winter in Southeast Asia, if you know anywhere from mid-November, they left there around April tenth. Uh, so our bird, uh, L1, flew from Medan, Indonesia, again, across the time in the Malay Peninsula, took a very similar route across uh, inland Vietnam, and then went up the coast of China until it reached Chaozini. Uh, similar for D79, Frankie, uh, and Su Ching, uh, that flew up the... Um, coast of China. Su Qing was actually captured in Maipo, but again, continued up north along the coast and stopping in uh, the ancient Taos New wetlands that they use both during spring and fall migration. Then these birds flew across the Korean peninsula, began stopping in Gyeonggi Bay, that site on the border of North and South Korea. From there, uh, very few points at the moment, uh, especially for uh, L1 and Frankie, but it seems like L1 was on its, I'm sorry, um, D79 and Frankie, it seems like D79 uh, actually went all the way to Constantine Bay and did successfully breed there. There are many points in inland and um, coastal areas. And Frankie's points, unfortunately, the tag died or the bird died on the way, uh, but it seems like maybe it was headed to Shastia Bay. Uh, there are many more points for Su Ching that, after crossing the Korean Peninsula, went along the uh, coast of uh, the Russian Far East, stopping at three sites, the Maximovka, Samarga, and Dewey River mouths, before crossing the Tatar Strait to Vyak du Bay, where it also likely bred. So possibly a, um, two identif new identified breeding areas for the species. So some conclusions. Um, 
It seems from this limited tracking data that green shanks employ a jump and hop migration strategy, as in first they jump from a specific area without taking uh, very many breaks. For instance, here they travel at 2000 kilometers in about 49 hours. And then they took more of a, uh, a hop mig migration strategy, as in they used many different sites uh, over an extended period of time before they got to a more uh, permanent or extended migration or stopover area. So eight of our tagged birds used 29 unique sites throughout their annual cycle. Uh, specifically, uh, areas of importance were the Gyeonggi Bay area on the border of North and South Korea, Leonyungang, uh, of course, the Yangcheon wetlands, uh, Shasti Bay, Konstantin Bay, the inner Gulf of Thailand, that place in Vietnam, the coast of Myanmar, West Bengal. So we really identified many more areas of importance for green shanks and really highlights that we need to protect not just certain areas like Shasti Bay, uh, and Taozini, but really uh, a plethora of sites throughout the entire flyway. And especially estuarine sites, most of these, I'm sorry, all of these sites were estuarine areas with uh, a certain level of mudflat availability. And if you take a, a zoomed out picture of all of these points, you really start to get a, an idea of Nordman's Greenshanks habitat needs and how much they really seem to be coastal obligates, you know, except for uh, a few, you know, notable exceptions such as the inland Vietnam and migrating over um, the Korean Peninsula. All of these other points are on the coast and really highlights uh, that we need to be protecting all coastal areas, especially since the coasts are on the front lines of climate change and are also the most developed areas in the world. Um, so to protect shorebirds throughout the flyway, we really need to spread our net wide. And one final conclusion is perhaps the East Asian Australasian Flyway Shorebird uh, Conservation community should consider creating an international Nordman's Green Shank Task Force to gather all of our collective energy and protect the species throughout the flyway, maybe even combine it with the uh, Spoonbill Sandpiper Task Force to really uh, tackle this issue head on. So that was my talk. Thank you very much for your attention. And I look forward to your questions after um, Kim M's talk. So Dingley, back to you. Um, thanks. Thanks for uh, the wonderful talk. Uh... Philip and for uh, rounding us through not just its um, its breeding ecology in Russia, but also sharing some of these exciting updates and also congratulations on the paper. We will all uh, keep an eye on the paper to to read a bit more about the wonderful discoveries that you have. Oh, was that four nests? Four nests that you have found in the Russian Far East. Um, uh, I nine. think nine. nine nests. That's a really good number. Uh, um, and I think there's also some very clear-cut uh, conservation messages that I am sure Kim Im will echo as well, um, that coastal wetlands are really in trouble uh, all over the flyway. There's a bit of progress in recent years to, you know, step up conservation of these um, wonderful uh, habitats for shorebirds, but more needs to be done. And uh, I think it was also coming very clearly to many of us uh, from Philip's presentation that uh, green shanks have a really large gap in conservation coverage of its wintering habitat. So we have a few more sites protected in China, which is our important staging sites in the Yellow Sea, but Southeast Asia is one important wintering region uh, of which there are not many uh, protected area in the coastal zone. So that's probably uh, 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 something that we all need to think about and hopefully work towards, you know, who knows, a Nordman's Green Shank Conservation Task Force. Um, moving on from the uh, staging and wintering grounds, I would like to bring the audience to the next segment of our presentations today. Uh, we will now go towards the tropical wintering habitat of the Notman's Green Shank in Southeast Asia, right at the core of its, of its wintering range in Thailand. And I'm very pleased to have with us here today uh, Kimim or Kwan Kao Sinhaseni from the Bird Conservation Society of Thailand. Uh, Kimim is a colleague of mine th uh, through our OBC Bird Life Connection. And I know that she works very hard uh, with many of the other stakeholders in Thailand and across Southeast Asia to advocate for shorebird conservation. 
uh, she's done a lot of work and also in recent years worked with Philip to, uh, you know, to have more collaborative things for the, for the green shanks. And uh, I will let uh, Kim in, come in to tell her story about the work that her team has done to protect these uh, wonderful shorebirds. Kim in, over to you. Thank you so much, Ding Li. And anyway, um, I want to say good afternoon and also good morning for everyone as we know like we are in different parts of the world but i can say like something that to bring us to common is about we all love birds and we really care about the bird and the nature to be honest before we start i should say i'm not a birder this is the same that i want to tell everyone first because everyone keeps asking me about like oh can you work on the bird Conser conservation society of thailand you know all the birds in thailand no that is not correct my point is like I'm more into about conservation and I really care about the work with the communities and also to protect the habitat. And today I think Philip made a very great start about like Northman Green Shank is a kind of the umbrella species. Like once we protect this species, we can protect more on others. And also because of Northman Green Shank is super cute. I'm not sure like what other people think. Yes, but of course, at least to live and ice, we thought it's super cute. That's why in this way, we can attract more people in the field of the bird communities. And also we can attract more people try to get involved with the conservation. And this is also why one of the reasons why BCSC want to work on the Northman Green Shank or the Spot Green Shank. And another funny things about the Northman Green Shank like in Thai, we call this species is Nok Thale Kha Kheo La Chut. Nok is mean bird. Kha is mean lake. Kheo is mean green. For us, this is why we call Nok Thale Kha Kheo La Chut. It's a kind of the translate from the Northman Green Shank. But I feel like at least today, after you attend my talk, you can remember that. And maybe this is inspire you to want to see Northman Green Shank in Thailand. So, First, I would like to explain about this presentation a bit. Doesn't mean like I can do this work by myself. I have such a lovely team that we work on this project together. That's why today I want to cover about five more topics on this presentation. And for make sure like everyone know where we are. Yes, you're from Thailand, it's here. Some people say it's look like an egg. Yes, and I agree, it's look like an egg in the middle of the Southeast Asia. And the thing that we try to cover is first, what is Northman Green Shank? Why this is important? I think Philip gives such a great information about the habitat, especially in the breeding site. But how about Thailand? How is this important? I can say Thailand is a kind of here once we look from Russia up to Southeast Asia. And this spot is a kind of the place that provide the area during the wintering season. And for this wintering season, I can say in Thailand, we call this is winter. But as you know, this is not that cold. So that's why this is a great habitat for Northman during the cold winter in Russia for them to stay. And also the back of the time that I think Philip already mentioned that as well. It's like people also try to study not men once for a while in Thailand more than 10 years ago. And we try to identify where is the place that should be the habitat of not men green shank. And we found like mostly is in the inner gao of Thailand. And also most of their preference habitat is in the muskrat, salt pan and the usury. But the thing that I want to show you now is I want to confirm this information. That's why for us, we thinking about to set up the project and what we want to do a project. This is about three main objectives for this. First, we want to estimate and monitor the population of Northman Green Shank in Thailand. And the second one is, is really their habitat, the thing that I just mentioned before, it's like a mud flat, it's like a salt pan, is this really the habitat of the Northman? And the last, once we have this knowledge, how we let the public to get involved and make a movement in terms of the Northman conservation. Yes, first, we did a survey. 
So in Thailand, we have a, this lovely area that we call Inner Gao of Thailand, and we have this site that we call Andaman Coastal Line. The first survey we try to survey everywhere along this coastal line, both in Andaman and also in the Inner Gao of Thailand. This is quite covered about twenty three provinces, and the time that is perfect for Northman survey in Thailand. Is the time that they visit. It starts from October up to March every year. We have a lovely team, like mentioned, and also the thing that we try to do is by walking and also by boat as well. And the thing that we find that out is we know roughly in the world it's about like 900 up to 1,500 Northmen in the world. But how? Much, how many in Thailand? The last season, the number that we got is about 356. I can say it's about 30%. And this is better than we expect. And also the top three is one here is Pakale in Pechaburi. And the next one is in Rayong or Prasa is here. The number is 74, right? And the third number is on Grabi, usually. So what I want to emphasize this is, this number is very huge. So that's why we know this is a kind of a very important site. But how about other spots? Why the number so small? We still question on that. And I will explain about that more later. But once we know where is the major place for Northman is in Pakale, that's why we make a move. Pakale Nature Reserve, this is the kind of the land that BCSD decide to purchase the land. And once we monitor Northman on the site specifically, yes, it's huge. The number here is about like 250. And also the peak season is start from December up to February. And this is quite confirmed like this is the key site for Northman. And this area, we also work with the local communities. And so that's why we know like, once we want to protect the habitat of Northman, it's not only us to make a move on that. I will give you more details soon. Once we know about Bartle, Bartle is more about the soil pan production area. If some of you are not really familiar about how is the salt pan production, this way is very simple. Like you make a different pond, you direct the water, I mean the sea water to different ponds. After that, you try to let the sun do their own job to dry it, and then we can get the product like a salt like this. But something is very interesting is like because of this this pond turned to be the habitat of Northman and also with other shopper species. In the end, we can find like this area is very important because per year, this is the home for more than 10,000 birds use this land. And it's more than 100 bird species with sick bark clay. And for this, that's why, as I mentioned, we decide to purchase the land and try to manage this area with the local community to make sure like we can sustain the habitat of shorebird. All right, get back to more detail about Northman because now we know the roughly population of Northman. We know like how important of Bartle. That's why we know that is the key area for us to protect the shorebird and protect Northman. But how about another side? The thing that we try to do the survey is not just only to count the number. I know my team feel really fun to just go in the field and count the number. And apart from that, they also eat lovely seafood. But the thing that they try to do as well is like to observe the landscape and also observe the behavior. And the thing that we find out is like different type of the land, like usually salt pan, mud flat, also mud flat mixed with the sand. It can be both rooting and the feeding side of Northman. When I say why, why, it means it's more activity on another thing. 
For example, like in the usury, it's more about a kind of the feeding side than the roosting side. In general, that's why most of these habitat can be a good place for feeding for northmen. However, things always happen as well because in many places along the coastal line, it's not protected by the government. So that's why sometimes the land has been changed. And this is also one of our concerns in terms of the habitat change because of the human purpose. For example, they try to establish some the boat docks. They try to sell the mud from the uh, mud fat area. And also they try to manipulate the area to change the water channel. So that's why this is the one thing that we know is going to be the huge effect on the habitat of the shorebird, especially for Northmen. Back to this map again. You can see like from the map that we tried to show you recently is this one. And this is the map that people reporting about Northman before as well. So this is pop up in our mind a few things. First, probably maybe we not really survey enough to get all the number of Northman. If mean like that. We thought this is about more than 350 Northmen in Thailand, but if we do more intensively survey, probably we can find more Northmen. Second thing, do we try to scan every single place and then we can find more like maybe they also have other places that can be a good habitat of Northmen as well. But because of the limitation of the time and the resources, we can find, identify only these few places. And also we still question this, but the thing that we try to do is to overcome about this limitation. We thought if we need more people, maybe we can get some collaboration from other groups. Moreover, maybe we can include about the citizen science program to help us to continue monitoring. Let me give you some example, like one of the collaboration, like that's why we have Philip Melacos also do the survey and also do satellite tracking because by our own um, power and skill, we cannot do as thing that Philip do. But we still have other group of the people who live along the coastal line. And we know this is going to be very helpful to help us to monitor Northman. That's why we work with the communities so in the south, we identify four groups. In the east, we identify two groups. And in the central part, quite close to Patele, we also identify another two groups. The thing that we try to do is like, we know this is the key site. And we also want them to interest it about the Northman and other birds. The thing that we try is like, we try to work with them what is their own interest in terms of the bird conservation, especially about not men. So we try to support them. Like recently, we already did two workshop with the local community, how to identify shorebirds. And sounds like young people really into that. Moreover, some area like in central part of Thailand, they know like, this is not just only about the fun activity. It can be the activity that can generate their own income to be a bird guide. So now we keep working with different group of the people because we know one way. This is the way that they can help us to monitor the bird. And this is another way around to ask them to support us to protect the habitat for Northman as well. And as I already touched a bit, like we need more data, we need more people. What we really try to do before, once we work with the communities, and now the thing that we try to do is like we try to promote Northman Green Shank. This is a kind of our champion species. We make a leaflet and we also make like a different kind of the promotion stuff that people can get to know more about Northman. Now I can say in general, many people know Spoon Yusan Taipo. 
But how about not men? Some group of the people know it very well, but we still need more people to do this one and know about this. That's why last year, the thing that we did during AWC and also during like the big day that people keep reports about the birth. If anyone can report about not men, they will get some special prize. That's why I show this one. For us, the thing, once we have some event, we try to make more things to combine it together. Apart from that, this is also in our strategy is like, we try to have more about word talk. For the word talk, it's been quite similar like what we are doing here, but this is more a high target group, like people who work and live in Thailand to know more about not men. And also the last thing, and I think it's not the less important, but it's the most important is about this one. We realize about the power of the young people. So that's why the thing that we do is like, we set up the camp end of this year and also last year as well. The thing that we do is we try to recruit the new people who want to do more on the communication, like photography, documentary, uh, journalists, they join us and write something or create the content about the short world, especially about North Man. And I can say like this kind of camp is really powerful because we get more people who are want to interact about the short bird conservation. Once they produce their own work, this is even more powerful because we can use different channel and then we can talk more about not men and other short bird, but in different aspects than just only BCSC try to communicate just in direct way. And this is the kind of the thing that we try to do, work with the communities, raise more awareness, and also try to do like some related about the education activities. And in general, I can feel like this is a kind of BCSC move that we try to do because we know we are one of the part of the flyway. If one of the place blues along the way, not men or other species, we lost their habitat along the way. But mostly the places that we work with is not only in the government protected area. For us, we try to make other land still be a kind of the friendly habitat for many shorebirds. And we hope like this is our small action can contribute to our flyway. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kim, for the wonderful presentation um, and also for taking us through some of the exciting work that your team is doing. Um, I think BCSD um, has done a lot for not one green shank conservation in Southeast Asia, probably more than any uh, other organization I, I am aware of. Um, and I congratulate for the excellent work that you have, you have done to promote uh, the profile of, of not just the green shank, but also other threatened waders in Thailand, you know, to the wider Thai public. And great to see that there's more and more awareness and that there's even more activities that you are planning this year uh, to reach out to the young people and uh, the people out there who are maybe general nature lovers, but would, through your work, uh, learn more about migratory shorebirds. Um, I know we are a bit close to the hour right now, but I do believe that we have a bit of time for questions and answers. And I, I, I'm also aware that there must be a few more questions uh, coming from the floor uh, on the conservation of the green shank. Uh, so um, I would like to invite everybody to share your thoughts, your reflections, and your questions in the chat box. I will, uh, together with my colleagues, run through those questions and then um, get our expert speakers um, to reflect on your questions and also to share their thoughts on some of your comments. But first and foremost, I think I see one uh, in the chat box right now. Um, and uh, I think just uh, uh, also I'd like to say a quick hi to many of our shortboard experts in the, in, in the Zoom room as well. I think we've got friends from all over the region, from Malaysia, from Thailand, from the Philippines, even from Bangladesh, uh, who have had their own experiences in monitoring and, and serving um, Notman's Green Shank. Um, one quick question, or should I say a comment? Um, this is coming from Arnie Jensen, uh, who is based in the Philippines. Arnie has made a comment here about um, his work in the Philippines. 
uh, he mentioned that there are two regular wintering sites for the Notman's Green Shank of about eight individual individuals in um, the island of Negros and in North Manila Bay in the province of Bulacan. Uh, Arnie is really keen to know um, where these birds that are showing up in the Philippines are coming from in terms of their breeding ranges. Maybe they stage and converge in the eastern parts of China, but where do they really breed? Are they in other parts of Russia? Um, suppose this question uh, can go out to Philip. Philip, maybe you can weigh in on this comment from Arnie. Hey, Arnie, that is an excellent question and one that I would love to find the answer to myself. Um, I saw you would like to put out some tags over there. I think that's an excellent idea. Uh, where do the Philippine birds go? Where do they come from? That's uh, that's an excellent question. I if if I had to if I had, had to just guess, I would say that they're probably coming from Sakhalin. You know, I I think um, many birds like to separate uh, latitudinally, longitudinally. You can kind of sections and, and migrate down. So maybe. Uh, you know, Sakhalin birds like to go down to uh, through Japan and then over to China and then down to more easternly countries. But at the same time, uh, um, Su Ching are, are bird tagged in um, Hong Kong uh, and the Maipo Nature is there. It bred in, in, in Sakhalin and right now is in West Bengal. So. <laughs> Um, quite the opposite of the Philippines and very, very, you know, opposite directions. So maybe they're doing kind of a crisscross pattern uh, and easternly uh, breeding birds are actually wintering in the West. So many questions left unanswered. Maybe, maybe tags are the way. Thanks, Philip. Um, yeah, as you say, um... I think the uh, emergence of tracking technology has changed a lot of the, you know, the the landscape in studying sh uh, shorebirds. But even with that amount of tracking and ringing and lake flags coming up, um, there's still a lot that we can learn. Um, and I suppose we can find out a bit more in the coming years from your work, and also from your collaborations with Kimim, looking more closely at the Notman's Green Shanks in in Thailand. Um, I think there's a comment coming from. Uh, a friend in Indonesia, um, and uh, I'm not sure how many Indonesian colleagues are, uh, but Indonesia is obviously an important country for wintering green shanks. Uh, we know that a lot of green shanks go to Sumatra. Um, I think there, are, there have been counts of uh, as many as 100 birds, but maybe less so for the island of Java. But here's a, here's a comment or a question from our colleague, uh, Mr. Muhammad Al-Fatih. So, uh, Mohammed is from uh, Sabalas Maret University in Indonesia, and he is studying uh, shorebirds in Jogja, in central part of Java, at the well-known uh, Progo River Delta. Um, he is keen uh, in his comments. Uh, I, I can we could see that uh, he wants to know a little bit more about how we can uh, define stopover and wintering sites. Um, and he's asking whether if there is a, a clear uh, scientific method to determine whether if a site is a stopover site or a wintering site uh, or a staging site. Is there any scientific method for figuring out how we tell these sites apart from each other? Um, I think this comment could go to both Kimim and Philip. Feel free to weigh in your thoughts on how we can define a site to be stopover or wintering. Uh, if I may go first, Kimim. Oh, yep, go um, for it. <laughs> I, from my understanding, I believe it is based on the duration that a bird actually spends in a specific area. So especially for so, so staging and stopover is definitely more for uh, the central part of the flyway, specifically, you know, Tawazidi um, and other in coastal China. But for instance, those stepping stone sites where a bird only spends, you know, several hours can be considered uh, with staging right, or pre preparing for migration, several weeks staging. If it's there for several months, I believe that is a stopover. Um, uh, but of, in the wintering areas, um, it gets a little bit more dicey because some of these birds, has, as we have been finding out from some tracking, can be a bit more nomadic. 
Uh, so many air, many birds do spend an entire wintering period, you know, anywhere from November to April in basically one site, such as one of our birds spending the entire time in Medan, Indonesia. Uh, but other birds, such as Su Ching, went, uh, spent a month in Myanmar and now almost two months in West Bengal. So uh, I would consider both of those areas as overwintering areas, even though it's switched sites halfway through. So really, for, for me, it's more of the duration of time uh, an individual spends at a certain site. Yeah, like for, for myself, I think not really add on that much because I think Philip explained very well. Only the thing that I just add on is like, um, this is for the factors, but the thing that we can do more is like, we need to have a regular survey because you asked about like scientific method, right? Sometimes that means we have to repeat in some spot and then maybe we can identify something. It means we should, we should have like a regular survey in different spot and for make sure like we, um, what I can say, the way that we manage the data is also very important. And once we analyze that in the end, so this is my main toy because I think the thing that Philip explained is quite over everything already. Thanks, thanks, Kim, and thanks, Philip, for uh, sharing your thoughts on how we can, you know, pinpoint whether these sites are wintering or staging sites. Yeah, but I think obviously um, going to the site to check it regularly uh, would be key to figuring out whether. But mm -hmm. I, I guess more likely if the sites are in Southeast Asia, there are, there there's a very high chance that these sites are. Uh, indeed wintering sites yeah but even then there could be some sites that are fairly um uh very much used just by the birds uh while they're moving on to some other locations yeah so thanks thanks again kimim and philip for your thoughts on this um there are two more questions and uh, let uh i think um maybe more than two questions, uh, but let me just uh, run through these questions very quickly. Um, there's one coming in from Arnie, uh, Arnie based in the Philippines, and Arnie has a question on the population uh, of the the birds breeding in Sahalin Island. Um, I'm not sure if there's much work done in recent years on that population, but uh, maybe uh, Philip uh, would like to uh, weigh in on this question from Arnie. Over to you, Philip. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Arnie, for the excellent question again. Sakhalin is a difficult case. Um, before, back in the 1970s, it had a lot of suitable habitat, but in the last, uh, you know, 40 years, there's been a lot of oil and gas exploration, especially offshore, that has really degraded a lot of habitat. So uh, there are several ind individuals out there that do quite a lot of work um, surveying shorebirds, and I think they found. 10, 15, 20 green shanks every year, um, but not a very high quantity. And it's it's rather difficult to actually get to a lot of these sites. Um, but I, I would say it's not particularly high. That being said, um, there are many yet unsurveyed, maybe, you know, quote unquote, undiscovered sites. For instance, this uh, Viaktu Bay area, uh, where Suching may have bred. Nobody really has ever surveyed that site before. And, you know, we had that individual spend the entire summer there. So now in June, we are, the WCS is sending uh, a trusted colleague, Konstantin Maslowski, who is not in this meeting, but should have been. He would have been an excellent person to answer this question. Uh, so we, so WCS is sending him to that site to survey um, and in that work, he'll also be serving other sites around. Uh, so if I had to guess again, I'd say maybe 30 individuals uh, in the north northern area, but it could be easily more. Thanks, Philip. And uh, I hope that uh, answered uh, Arnie's question on the Sakhalin population uh, of the Notman Green Shank. Um, I think we've got two or three more questions, but I'm mindful that we are running a little bit short on time. So I'll try to cover the, the next three questions and then we can call it um, a morning or an evening, depending on where in the world you are. Uh, we've got a question coming from David Bakewell. Uh, David, as we all know, is a well-known shorebird specialist in Southeast Asia and has been scrutinizing shorebirds in, in this region uh, for a long time. He's also very much instrumental in uh, trying to promote shorebirds to uh, the public. And it's got a question uh, here in the chat I can see. Um, he first thanked the two of you for your talk. Uh, he notes that there are quite a number of grassroots organizations and individuals from across Southeast Asia 
and he says uh, it would be wonderful if an informal network uh, could be set up to connect these people in Southeast Asia. Um, I think uh, he's really keen to hear from Kim Im, uh, what are your experiences in trying to, you know, promote awareness and also to bring together people or networks of people, including local people, uh, on shorebird conservation? Maybe Kim Im, you would like to weigh in on this. Kim Im. All right, thank you. Like I can say to work with the community is a kind of for myself and my team, we call a kind of the adaptive management. It's a kind of like sometimes we come up with about the shorebird, right? But anyway, if some of them not really have any background about the shorebird, we have to get back a bit, like start from the word. How important of the bird, like something that is can be like that too. But if some group that are a little bit more advanced, they realize that have some bird around their land, we're gonna talk about the value of the shorebird. And that mm -hmm. is the way that we try to use. That's why we try to talk about the benefit of the bird. And then once we talk about that, we can say like, okay, if we think what we want to do, what we can do in the future together. This is the thing that we try to do. Then like we just say, I want to train you about this because once if I say what I want to do, they will join, but then they not really continue the things. But once we try to plan together, this is a kind of the way to help them to feel like this belong to them. And the second thing I feel like all the community, they don't feel like they want to work alone. They want to feel like they have other community also want to work with them, all have the same situation with them. Sometimes that's why we also have a kind of the study tour, like to share the knowledge, and this is gonna be quite helpful. So I I, I not I cannot say like we did the best already, but now we really learn to do that. And we also thinking like we try to learn from different country as well, how they work with the community or do community engagement. We try to bring that thing. But the most important thing that we try is about what the benefit that they can get. We talk about that first. They will want to work with us after that, if we mention that. Yeah. Thanks, Kim. Um, thanks for reflecting on your experience in trying to bring together different uh, local groups um, and obviously knowing uh, and getting um, the local groups to be aware and cooperating is uh, an important part of shorebird conservation uh, because ultimately they are living there in that landscape. They are eyes on the ground and they can also work with other groups around the country to, you know, share experiences and and their, their, their work uh, on shore, but thanks for your uh, your thoughts and also thank you to uh, Dave for raising this um, this this point uh, on getting local networks together to protect species. Uh, I've got one uh, uh, question on the conservation of the green shank, uh, specifically on hunting, and this is probably an issue that Kim Im have thought about as well, uh, and perhaps even Philip as well in your work in 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 Russia and elsewhere. Um, is hunting an issue at any of the passage or wintering sites for the green shanks. Are you aware that the green shanks have been hunted in the coastal areas of East Asia and Southeast Asia? Maybe uh, Kim, you want to weigh in on this? Yes, sure. I can say like um, to rely on the wildlife meat as the protein is quite common in Southeast Asia, but doesn't mean I promote that, okay? But my point is like this is ongoing. But the thing that we try to do is like, we try to be more informative than we try to be strict with them. And this is the same way. That's why I and the CSC try to work with the community. Recently, we also know like some of our sites have someone try to put a net and try to trap the bird. And the thing that is make us to try to make things more compromised is we let the community leader to take the lead to warn them not like bring the police to arrest them because i can say like all the bird species in thailand mostly is protected species even you can trap in your land it's still illegal but then to make enemy to arrest them we try to make friends by like we let the community talk to the communities and we hope this way it's going to be more helpful and also try to put more side to explain about this. And I can say it, it's not that easy. It's also still ongoing, but I can say in Thailand it's become less and less, mm. but still have some case. 
thanks Warren, but uh, great to see that there's a, a community approach to, you know, uh, get the hunters to hopefully become our friends and collaborators in the future. Yeah. Uh, what about Philip? Philip, what do you have any experiences uh, uh, or awareness of the hunting issue in the landscapes that you work in? Uh, yeah, certainly hunting is a big issue in the Russian Far East. Um, over there, the common green shank is considered a game species, whereas the Nordman's green shank is an endangered and you know illegal to hunt. And of course, many hunters can't really identify between the two, especially on the fly. Um, so uh, Nordman's green shanks in, invariably do get taken. Um, there have been recent surveys on Kamchatka and Sakhalin Island, as well as down the coast of the mainland. Russia and there have been um, shorebird hunters in Shasti Bay. I know before there used to be a um, a delicacy of knot soup in the region. You know, um, unfortunately, we don't have an organization as wonderful as BCST to become friends with all the locals and um, you know educate uh, the public, but. We do have other individuals and, and organizations that go around and, and try to bring awareness to sherbert populations. When, when I and my colleagues are there, we definitely try to promote shorebird conservation and alternative means of income. Um, at the end of the day, a lot of a lot of the reasons why people hunt shorebirds is not because they want to, but because they have to. Um, but it is definitely a problem in Russia as well. Thanks. Thanks for that, uh, Philip. Yeah, indeed a problem uh, in Russia and hopefully, you know, the work that you are doing um, together with others are able to, you know, get uh, people more aware of this uh, issues of hunting. Um, I think one of the big challenges for us is that many of these shorebirds have dangerously low populations and every little bit of uh, threat from hunting and habitat loss adds uh, much more pressure to their tiny population. So definitely an issue, a conservation issue that uh, many of us are working on. And I think some of you who are um, plucked into the conservation circles for sure, but you know that there's a hunting task force has been established uh, in the CMS, the Convention of Migratory Species and the East Asian Australian Flyway Partnership uh, to, to bring governments to come together to look at hunting issues. So, so it's a problem, but uh, we are trying to mobilize, the community is trying to mobilize um, efforts and expertise to deal with them. Um, I think many of us are probably going to get a bit hungry in, as the next few minutes pass by because it's dinner time in Asia and it's close to lunch time in in, the, in Europe. Uh, but let's have one final question. Well, there are actually a few more good questions coming in, but there's one. Uh, let's take one final question, and we could probably keep the the meeting on for a little bit more for a few conversations from our friends in the region. Uh, there's a there's a question um, on uh, tagging uh, of the Notman's Green Chain coming from our our friend and colleague at the RSPB, and this is coming from Guy Anderson that many of us work with in the shorebird uh, conservation community. Um, so Guy, thank the, the both of you for your excellent presentations, but uh, he's like to, uh, he would like to know a little bit more about uh, uh, tracking. Um, and he, here is his question. Um, experience with spoonbill sandpipers tell us that population estimates using mark recapture methods from mark birds are consistently higher than estimates based on counts, which is not surprising because it's hard to be sure where all the Notman Green Shank are. So um, he's made a comment uh, about uh, whether if there are opportunities to increase the number of individually marked birds, because knowing that more birds are mm -hmm. marked out there will really help in uh, making population estimates of the species as uh, what the Spoonie uh, conservation community have done in recent years. So maybe this is something that, uh, Philip, you might want to take on this question because you, you're sure. running around the mudflats putting tags on the birds, yeah. Sure, so uh, for the number of individuals banded and flagged throughout the flyway, I believe it is up to 25, if I'm not mistaken, 16 from Russia, I believe. Uh, going back to 2017, there are five from Thailand, I believe one or two in Indonesia, right? At least one from Hong Kong. Um, maybe, maybe I'm missing a few, but I, th I think the number is around 25. Um, how many of them are still alive is a different question. Um, it, it would certainly be wonderful to tag and band and, and um, deploy tracking devices on more green shanks. Uh, capture, capturing them is an issue of its own. 
Um, in the Russian Far East, uh, I would say it is rather um, easy to tag and, and capture and tag birds. You know, they have chicks that are tied. Um, they have, uh, yeah, chicks that keep birds tied to a specific area. And, you know, behaviorally, they're a lot easier to capture. Um, in Southeast Asia and China, the, the situation is very different. Um, they really don't have any specific area that bird that keep them um, for any any reasons that keep birds tied to a very specific area. So they're free to move around. They don't have nests or anything like that. So uh, catching them is a whole whole big challenge. That is really the, the I would say the biggest impeding factor to tagging more birds. Of course, going back to Russia and tagging more birds is would be wonderful, but the political situation there is not really um, conductive for it. So. Um, so well, I, I agree. Getting getting more taxes would, would be great. <laughs> yeah, and perhaps that could be something that that uh, can be coordinated by the now fictional Notman Green Shank Task Force going forward. Uh, once it becomes a reality, there will be more coordination uh, uh, across the region for all Green Shank workers to you know uh, put in more tax working, whether you are in China, Russia, or or Southeast Asia. Um, we are uh, a little uh, past our time, but I would just like to uh, run through a few comments and uh, thoughts from friends before we call it a day. So um, I think there's a few other comments that I would like to acknowledge because there's also a lot of good contributions from people in the room. Uh, like I said, there are many good, uh, good shorebird experts and conservationists in this, talk, um, in this call, and they have shared their uh, thoughts on the work that they are doing. I think Arnie has made a comment about the threat status uh, of the green shank being not critically endangered, but I suspect that this is going to be changed in the next few years because I'm aware that there's been a, a momentum to look into the status, the conservation status of many of these shorebirds in the next couple of months. Uh, thanks from Robert Grimman. Um, there's a comment from uh, Eric from Wisconsin, also thanking the speakers for your uh, your your insights from the work that you have done. Uh, Paul has made a really good comment on hunting and uh, uh, reflecting a, uh, on the progress that had been done uh, by people across the region. Hunting is obviously a big problem for shorebird conservation in our region, but uh, the good news is that there is effort, there's awareness, there's recognition of the problem, and there's more and more work um, not just uh, across the region, but also in country to address this problem. So lots of positive uh, actions in the flyway. Um, and also one comment from our friends in Malaysia, looking at the uh, Notman's Green Shank in Sarawak in the island of Borneo. Uh, not the most well-known wintering area for the, sh for the Green Shanks, but obviously as more and more counts are done on Borneo, we will find more of these Green Shanks. So um, I think that's all I've got here in the chat box. I hope I've not missed anything important, but um, I'd like to once again thank both speakers, uh, Kimim, uh, from the Bird Conservation Society of Thailand, uh, our bird life partner, and Philip Maleko from the Wildlife Conservation Society, um, working more closely in the uh, in Russia for their time. Um, it's close to the end of their day in where they are right now, uh, and we really appreciate uh, you making your time to share your expertise and insights on the work um, in the entire range of the Notman's Green Shank with the Shawbert Conservation Community and OBC members here. Thank you once again, and also thanks go to all the, uh, the Shawbert enthusiasts and uh, conservationists who are on the call for sharing your thoughts. Thank you once again, and uh, before I I, I say goodbye. Uh, I just want to let everybody know that uh, uh, the OBC team is now working on the next webinar, which will bring us into the into the conservation of yet another very charismatic species we have got here in Southeast Asia. Um, the next webinar, the date is not confirmed yet, but the next webinar will bring us into the world of the mass fin food uh, species that many of us know in Bangladesh and Cambodia. And that webinar uh, will be presented by our colleague Sayam Chowdhury. Um, so keep an eye on uh, updates from OBC and uh, thank you for joining us today and looking forward to having you at our next webinar. Thank you and good evening, good afternoon and good night. Thank you. Goodbye, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Well, uh, I know that some of us are still on the call, so feel free to say hi to people that you know. Uh, we always like to linger on for a bit to to uh, say hello to our friends and colleagues in the region. And feel free to unmute yourself.
Well, thank you, Kim and Philip. That was great. Really good. I need to go and see them nesting in those trees. It looks fantastic. <laughs> I really want to see that too. <laughs> yeah. It's just amazing. What a great, great shot. Right. <laughs> thank you so much, Guy. Uh, thank you for letting us join this one.